Okay, uh, so uh, welcome to uh, uh, one of the Jacobs Institute uh, design talks, <coughs> so one of several talks we're having this semester. Uh, today we're very happy to have uh, Professor Andy Dong from the University of Sydney. Uh, he's the war currently Andy is the uh, Warren Center Chair for Engineering and Innovation. Um, his research addresses the characteristics and attribu attributes of design knowledge and the causal importance of what else am I here? Causal importance of structure and processes of design knowledge production to design-led innovation. Um, Andy is a Berkeley academic, born and bred. He did his undergraduate here and got his PhD here. Uh, afterwards, uh, did you go directly to Sydney? Uh, a few years afterwards. Okay. And uh, he's a winner of numerous awards. Uh, we can go through them later if you would like. Uh, but since you are all waiting patiently, we'll let Andy get started on his talk right now. And thank you for. Uh, for thank you, Daryl. And thank you very much, everybody, for coming today on a Thursday afternoon. And I'm glad it's not raining. I think that that brings out a much better audience. Well, I was, originally I was going to give, I thought I was giving two talks. So the first talk I was going to give was going to be a much more technical talk. And so I thought the second talk could be a little bit more of a conceptual talk. And since I'm still only giving one talk, I'm still going to give you a little bit of a conceptual talk. And so the conceptual talk that I want to give you today is what I think is actually one of the most important and fundamental questions that a place like the Jacobs Institute should be answering, which is what is design? Where does it come from? What is its place in the natural world? This isn't a question that normally design researchers ask. We normally leave this kind of question to um, archaeologists or anthropologists to discuss. And yet I actually think it's a, a question that's of critical importance to taking a, a critical view um, on design. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about these two fundamental questions. What is design? Where does it come from? And I'm hoping that during that elaboration, I'll also be able to show how developing knowledge in that particular area has given us some really critical insight into looking at the particular question of how we design, which is to say it more prosaically, or also our capability to design. Now, the idea for this talk um, actually came out from 2009 when I was doing my sabbatical in London. And in 2009 was the sesquicentennial celebration of the publication of On the Origin of the Species. And I went to lots of different talks at the University of Cambridge um, about Darwin and about his work and about recent research. And of course, you know, it's, it's the UK. There's always a post-pub debate um, about a particular talk. And in the post-pub debate, almost every single person, when we talked about our research and what we were doing, they would say, well, you know, Andy, design is a pretty important area. What do you guys know as a field about the origins of design? Like, wh where does that capacity come from? Do we think that any other animals or non-human species have the capability to design? What cognitive skills do you think are involved? I mean, you know, a lot of the kind of questions that a lot of linguists have, started, have already been asking that question. And I'm really unfortunate to say that my community of design research hasn't had a lot to say about this particular area. And in fact, if you go around looking at lots of, much of the evidence, there really is no discussion about where did this come from? Is there any continuity for, within our uh, closest um, species, great apes, species, the great apes? In fact, is design something that's so completely unique? Or is it an exaptation of other skills that we developed during human evolution? And of course, the big question is, even if you knew that, well, how would you use that particular knowledge to help you advance your understanding of what design is and how you can do that um, as a professional practice? So that's what I'm going to try to take us through today. We're going to look a little bit at the issue of animal innovation and what we can actually learn from other non-human species um, that perform what looks like design or design thinking, um, and because of that, are able to produce innovations. Now, let me just give you a, a brief road map of the talk. So I'm going to start out by talking about some of the biological um, evolutionary issues in relation to how we design. I'll move then very quickly into talking about how we see that scaffolding some of the cognitive skills, I'm sorry, so the cognitive strategies that we see being emphasized during design processes when we study expert designers doing that kind of work. And I'll relate that to some of my own research. And then finally, I'm going to end the talk about talking about the sociopolitical social justice issues about this issue of the capability to design, and that we cannot just assume that just because you are biologically programmed to be able to design, that everybody has a capability to design. And I'll talk about that in relation to some research work that we've been doing with Aboriginal Australians. OK, so I'm going to do that over roughly three premises. So the first premise I'm going to talk about is the fact that humans basically share um, a set of cognitive skills with our most closely related species, um, the great apes, which allow us to invent new worlds and the socio-cognitive behaviors to allow us to transmit 
by imitation, by learning those particular inventions, which is innovation. So the first bit, if you will, the, the capacity to design, uh, to invent new worlds, that's going to be the design component. And the second component, which is the innovation, which are the socio-cognitive behaviors that are associated with being able to adopt those particular um, innovations. And then what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to talk about some research I've been doing with a colleague of mine at the University of Queensland, um, who is a comparative psychologist, and talking about how we think that design cognition or design thinking might be well thought about as an extension or an, an optimal adaptation um, of our capacity for mental time travel. In other, or if you will, thinking about the future, being able to act with the future in mind, being able to identify ourselves with future worlds so that we can design to meet our future needs and to talk about why there are some particularly distinct and unique aspects of human cognitive skills that allow us to do that. And then I'll talk briefly about how that has some implication to design tools. And then, as I said, I'll end up with a talk about um, the fact that, I, that a lot of work I've been doing recently, which is looking at design as a capability. And I'll talk about the word capability in relation to the capability approach developed by Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum, and why we've been advocating that design has to be a skill uh, and a capacity over which we exert a moral claim, not just a practice-oriented claim. Okay, so let's start on, on the first premise. Like you, I had to slip one slide in about Australia here to make sure that you know I'm from Australia even though I have an absolutely zero Australian accent. So we are clearly not the only non-human species to innovate. And perhaps when, in every continent, um, by the way, let me just say that I have to be very careful because when I worked with my colleagues who are comparative psychologists, they do not want me to say other species necessarily. And they do want me to identify that there are other non-human species because we are a species as well. So in, in, def in, in deference to that, I will always try to say non-human species. We're not the only non-human species to innovate. So the bowerbirds um, of, of Queensland or tropical Queensland and also of Papua New Guinea are well known to build these, what we would be called the Taj Mahals um, of, the, of the bird kingdom. They make very elaborate nests and the quality of these nests are correlated to the mating success. So yes, it is true with the relation to the bowerbirds that the male bowerbirds must do all the work in order to attract a female bowerbird. And what's really interesting, of course, is that there's actually no, there isn't necessarily just a single bower. The male bowerbirds have a preference for the color blue. And what's also very interesting is that while they generally will uh, try to collect blue flowers and decorate their bowers with blue flowers, they also collect blue bottle caps because uh, apparently the blue bottle caps are considered novel um, by the female bowers. And so you often will see bowers decorated with blue bottle caps. Uh, the joke being, of course, I wouldn't recommend that you necessarily give your partners blue bottle caps in relation to the blue orchids. You probably want to stick with nice flowers. What's also very interesting, though, is that there's also intracultural variation. So exactly the kind of thing that one would expect in relation to design. In other words, while you would see a standard bower, each of the bower tries to modify his bower just a little bit to make sure that it's novel because, they, because the female birds key into this novelty. So there's this intrinsic value for novelty. And as well, what's also interesting, of course, is the male bowerbirds attack each, uh, each other's bowers and also try to take away things from each other's bowers just to make sure that they're not very attractive um, and the female bower won't, um, uh, won't be attracted to that particular bower. But the bowerbird is very far away from the human lineage species, and so you know, that's not really the species I'm going to focus on for tonight. We're really going to try to talk more um, about the great apes because they are the closest species, um, non-human species, uh, to humans. And it is already well known now that in relation to the great apes, we see a lot of evidence of animal innovations. We see evidence of animals being able to invent uses um, for, um, with things that look like tools. They're able to engage in means and reasoning, and they're able to transmit some of that innovation to others. So uh, in, I can't remember, in the 60s or so, when Masao Kawai published the, uh, the observation of a female uh, macaw monkey, washing sweet potatoes in water, and that, that washing of the sweet potato was then adopted by other um, uh, monkeys. That was considered a, um, evidence of an animal innovation because the animal invented this new behavior, which was to wash the sweet potato, and then the other animals adopted that particular behavior, and then they started to, uh, to wash the, the sweet potatoes as well. But also, what's fascinating is not every single animal necessarily adopted that. So that was a, a inter, that was an intergroup cultural variation, and not all monkeys um, ended up doing um, that type of sweet potato washing. 
So it, it actually raises a very, very interesting set of criteria that the animal psychologists develop. The fact that an, an animal innovation has to be that it resulted from the invention of a new object or a new behavior, and that uh, that invention of that new object or behavior could not have been done because of the fact that the environment afforded it. So the environment did not force that particular behavior. For some reason, the animal had to be able to have the skills, if you will, to be able to invent that behavior. And then the other animals within their, their troop would have to have the skills to be able to adopt that. And that, to me, starts to sound a lot like the innovation theory and innovation literature that we talk about um, within our own area. So what is it that they do that we can learn from in relation to learning about our own abilities for design? One really recent um, controversial finding, well, not too recent, but a fairly controversial finding, is the fact that they've also discovered evidence of what, what um, the archaeologists like to call a chimpanzee uh, stone age, because there were chimpanzees in a, a particular uh, rainforest in Africa that developed percussion tools, you know, in other words, hand tools to crack open their nuts. And it was only this particular troop of chimpanzees that developed that technique. Not all chimpanzees necessarily opened um, their nuts by using a percussion tool. Some of them favored just directly cracking the nut on a particular rock. What's interesting about that finding is that this, that, that, that tool was discovered contemporaneously with, I'm sorry, before the uh, evidence of an agricultural society emerging in that particular area. So it raises the question then, in terms of our ancestor, did we actually learn how to make some things from other um, non-human species and then adapted them for our own purpose? Or was there actually technological convergence in which, we, you know, in which basically we discovered at the same time that we could also use percussion tools for different purposes? But I think that the, the point is that the evidence is already out there. Animals definitely innovate. Animals have a certain set of cognitive skills that allow them to create new uses for objects and then to pass that usage on. What are those skills and how can we uh, use the understanding of those skills to interrogate our own understanding of what we call design and what we, in, and what we might think about as something that's actually unique to humans but may actually also exist um, in other non-human species. Okay, so this has basically been the focus of my work then from since about 2009 and I've been um, intensely collaborating with one of my colleagues, um, Professor Thomas Suddendorf um, at the University of Queensland and one of his uh, former postdocs, um, Emma Collier-Baker. So Thomas Suddendorf's area of research is in mental time travel um, and the development of representational skills in young children. And he's written very extensively um, upon that particular topic. And the way that we kind of got together, if you will, in terms of a research relationship, was I actually posed to him exactly the question that I asked you tonight. I asked him, you know, if I asked you where did this ability to invent new objects come from, can you talk to me about how this might have happened um, in the animal species? And, and what would be the closest set of cognitive skills that you might have found um, in other animals? And with that question, he called me and said, we should have a chat because we don't really know the answer to that question. And, and let's really talk about this. So over the past two years, we've been developing through the scholarly research um, a hypothesis that tries to go at answering, well, what would be the basic cognitive skills that we expect to see a continuity of in relation to the great apes and then all the way into humans. By the way, I'm assuming that nobody in here is questioning evolution because if you do question evolution, then the whole, my whole topic just completely, you know, it, it's, over. it's already over. So, uh, so assuming that you believe in, uh, you, you ascribe to the theory of evolution, which I, I think that that's probably a safe assumption, you know, we, we're insisting that there should be some uh, continuity in terms of the evolution. Um, I also forgot to mention one. So, so if you do talk about this particular question to lost anthropologists, there is a lot of talk in the anthropology community and there's a debate around the question of the creative explosion, which was a period in time where suddenly it seemed as if humans became really smart and were able to develop representation of skills. We suddenly saw art. We saw proliferation of um, rep, uh, representations on caves. We saw all sorts of things like that. And the statement normally is, well, humans just became smart. But that's not really a great answer in terms of research. You know, what, is, what made them smart so they could actually design the world um, in, in, uh, in, in relation to their future needs to secure the survival of our species? What is that skill that we're looking at? So we propose that there are three different skills, and I'll go through them one by one. Those three unique skills are recursion, uh, representation, but really meta-representation, and curiosity, which is a little bit different from curiosity in the way that it's often taught, taught, taught thought about in psychology. Okay, so recursion. Again, I'm, I'm guessing that most people in here probably already know what recursion is, at least from a computer science point of view. But recursion is basically the ability to embed a computation within some other computation. 
And the idea, of course, is that recursion would have been absolutely essential for our ability to design. Why? Because design almost always entails starting from some simple, some simple elements and building upon those elements, in a sense, recursively. So for example, if we take a computer, your CPU can be thought of as recursively built up as with um, memory chips. Each of those memory chips are also built of logic gates, which are then built of transistors. So there are recursive relationships in there. So the ability for us to take these particular objects and recursively build upon them would have been absolutely essential for us to develop very complicated um, objects. So for example, some of the Acheulean tools or some of the other uh, tools that have been discovered in archaeology archaeologists have tried to replicate how it would have been that they would be created, and they, which they actually show, and you actually you see this a lot in the literature, they talk about recursive operations, but without talking about recursion necessarily as a cognitive skill that would have been developed in order to support that. Now, in relation to recursion, this is actually the only cognitive skill for which it has not been identified in the animal kingdom, other than for humans. There's only been one study that has been published um, in 2006 in which some colleagues at Cambridge University purported to have trained um, some European starlings to be able to sing a context-free grammar. Unfortunately, there have been alternative explanations to show that the, the um, starlings did not necessarily know a context-free grammar, and they could have simply memorized um, the songs. And so therefore, there's a, still a very strong argument that recursion would be a uniquely human skill. This has also been argued, of course, in the linguistics community, where recursion is considered um, by, uh, by um, and I drew a name blank. I can only think of Thomas Pink, uh, Pinker, uh, anyways. Uh, pardon? Chomsky, thank you. That recursion is the only unique um, aspect of, of, of language. And it probably is also a unique aspect for many other particular skills as well. We also know likely that recursion is not evident in other animal species because recursion would be necessary for what, and I'll elab continue elaborating on this, mental time travel. So mental time travel is basically the ability for you to um, act, with your, uh, act with yourself in relation to the future. In other words, it, it underpins the ability to plan for the future. And so far, there has been no strong evidence to show that animals can plan with the future in mind. There was one study, however, that did generate a lot of popular press, and it was about this chimpanzee named Santino um, at a zoo. And it was purported that this observation was of a chimpanzee who could plan. Because what Santino would do, Santino did not like tourists, apparently. So what Santino would do is he would uh, collect a, a bunch of rocks, which the, the examples are there on the right-hand side, and then place them in a particular position so that every day when the tourists came to look at Santino, Santino would throw the rocks at people. So they use that as evidence that, well, maybe Santino does actually know how to plan. Turns out that it's probably not likely that Santino um, did any planning, but what unfortunately did happen to Santino was that they felt that maybe he was too aggressive and took biological measures to reduce his aggression. So just remember that before you start throwing rocks at people next time, um, that biology may, get, may catch up with you. Okay, so that's, um, that's recursion. The second skill, of course, is representation, the ability to be able to represent the world. But we do a lot more in design than what is called primary representation. In other words, a representation which has some type of fidelity with the natural world around us. We can produce models of the way that we see the world. And finally, we can produce what are called meta-representations. The fact that we understand that when we represent something, that representation itself has an interpretation. So for example, I can, of course, represent that a banana is a banana, because that is semantic fidelity with the banana, and I would actually try to eat my banana. If I'm a two to three-year-old, I start to be able to represent that uh, that banana is not necessarily a banana, but it's a telephone. So that's considered an example of secondary representation. The child now is holding a model of a telephone in his mind or her mind, but doesn't actually think that the banana is a phone, but will try to talk to it. Meta-representation, then, is the fact that you represent the fact that, that your representation of the banana as being a toy versus as being a, a, a tool, for example. And so if I change my what-if representation, what if I think of this banana not as a toy, but as a tool, then I might have some other representations for that. And that recursive operation on that representation, which is a meta-representation, is absolutely vital to our ability to do the what-if projections. In other words, to be able to invent new interpretations of something that does not yet exist. 
And so meta representation would have been the absolutely vital skill that we were able to develop because we have recursion and are able to represent on top of our representations to be able to invent these new particular worlds. Let me just say, there was one really, really exciting part about our research. And you know, when you do research, every once in a while, you have that, the really great light bulb moment where you make a connection across disciplines and across fields. And this is one of the particular situations. So when um, Thomas talked to me about you know, the three levels of representation in their development in children, immediately I thought of Shonen Wiggins' paper. For those of you who are design theorists and you know, design students, you, you might have read this paper. But in Shonen Wiggins' paper, they mentioned three different kinds of ways that designers represent the world. They talk about what they call the literal vir uh, visual apprehension. So for example, the L shapes. There's some semantic fidelity between that representation and calling them the L shapes. He talks then about the apprehension of the figures, a space which is more of a home base. And that is exactly secondary representation. It is now a model of the thing that is presented to them. And finally, the, and the most important part, is then they talk about the appreciation of forms, configurations, and moves, which is exactly a meta representation. The fact that they represent that this particular representation of the buildings in a particular way expresses a notion of harmony and that they understand, or we as humans intuitively already understand that we can modify the way that we understand the, how we're modeling something. So that is meta-representation. And so the alignment between those two particular aspects, you know, this particular design theorization of how do designers see the world and this particular work in early childhood uh, development as well as comparative animal psychology, lining up in such a very nice way um, on one single uh, research article, I thought was quite a beautiful and, and, and interesting discovery that we made. So we see a lot of uh, skills for representation, obviously, in the great apes. And the great apes pass almost every single one of the secondary representation tests. One of the classic secondary representation tests is the mirror self-recognition test, which is, means, in other words, that the chimpanzee or um, elephants have also passed this, and dolphins have also passed this test, are able to understand that what they see in the mirror is a representation of themselves. It is a model of themselves. It is not another chimpanzee, but it is not them themselves either. And that's an important skill um, to, to, to identify. Because basically what that means is that we already developed secondary representation skills about 14 million years ago. Because that's where we know the great ape genera goes back to. There's another kind of interesting piece of evidence that could be really looked upon. There's a book by uh, an author named Timothy Thomas uh, called The Artificial Ape. And Timothy Thomas argues that humans are actually artificial because what we've done is we've designed things. And as we design things, they change the trajectory of evolution. And the particular design that he talks about is the sling. So the fact that you're now able to give birth and the child's brain can use to develop outside of the womb would have changed the trajectory of human evolution in terms of the size of the cranium because the, cranium, the child still has to be able to, um, to, be, to be given birth. What's really quite interesting about that particular question then is did we invent this sling? Or was that, again, was that technological convergence be so, because we saw other animals holding their children on their back? And then all we had to apply is very simple means and reasoning, which we know exists um, in, in all the great apes. And that would have been all that was necessary for us to start designing um, very simple devices, such as um, a sling. OK. And then the final one is curiosity. The one skill that I think is most often downplayed in design um, and often downplayed in organizational research about why particular organizations are creative or not creative. And this curiosity is a lot more than simply an interest to, to know, know about something. So for example, I may be really interested to learn more about mathematics, but it's a field and it's something that I already know in a sense that is already there. But there's something about design which is this intrinsic interest in both novelty and value. You cannot resist or prevent yourself, actually, in thinking about things in new and novel ways that are also valuable to you, that have some kind of utility. And you derive so much pleasure about thinking in your head, let's just say, for example, your dream house. You've never seen your dream house. You don't even ever have to build it. But there's a simple pleasure that is involved within that particular capacity just to imagine that. And so we think that there must be some intrinsic and innate interest in novelty and value, which would have developed during evolutionary timescales. So how do we know that? And why do we think that humans have a very interesting level of curiosity? Well, we know, for example, that larger mammals tend to be more curious than smaller animals, even when you control for the size of the object. So a really interesting study was done by Glickman and Strogus back in the 60s, in which what they did was they gave different zoo animals different objects 
that were well proportioned in relation to their body size to try to see, well, how would in animals interact with these objects? In other words, how curious might they be about those particular objects? And they found that larger mammals tend to be more curious than smaller animals. Takashi Torigo repeated that um, analysis a little bit more rigorously. And what he did when he plotted his results was that he looked at it in two um, uh, orthogonal factors. One, which was the diversity of the manipulation, so the number of different things that animals do to the particular foreign object that they're given. And the second axis, which is axis two, is non-substrate actions. In other words, you, they didn't just put it on the ground and try to stomp on it or something like that. They actually try to understand, if you will, its affordance, you know, the kind of things that we talk in terms of design theory. And sure enough, um, the great apes come up tops in terms of the fact that we're more curious, we do more things with the, that particular object, and we do things with the object that do not rely on the substrate. So we are actually already, in terms of, of that, looking to understand what is the affordance of this particular material, what can I do with it? Which, for those of you who in design theory know that, you know, affor about affordance theory. Of course, humans are the most curious. And curiosity, in terms of the animal kingdom, though, would have been important to help them to lead opportunistic lifestyles, which is, of course, what humans do. Okay, so to sum up, the three important strategies are recursion, meta-representation, and curiosity. So, how do we think and why do we think that these are going to be the foundational cognitive skills that are related to design? Um, and, and how do we see them expressed in the kind of cognitive strategies that we know designers are doing? Well, the connection that we make is through the capacity for episodic foresight, the capacity that we're able to, in, um, to think about the future and to simulate, if you will, the sequence of events that will lead into the future. So Thomas wrote a fairly influential paper about this um, particular topic, and, and he, I'm uh, oh, sorry, I skipped one slide. So, I'm sorry, so our theory is that the, one of the primary functions of mental time travel or adaptations of mental time travel is design. So design is actually an extension of our ability to do mental time travel. And we wrote about that um, for a book chapter in the Oxford um, Handbook on the Development of Imagination. So why did we come up to that um, conclusion? Well, in the paper where he defined mental time travel, he basically said there are three things that happen in terms of the cognitive mechanisms that you need to mental time travel. First of all, you must represent the elements of an episode, those are the, each part of a story, for example then you have to apply recursion in order to generate episodes from those basic episodes. And he also said that there has to be something in there where you're trying to anticipate future events. You, your, your brain has to have to be some intrinsic mechanism where it wants to represent something that is not currently there, that it cannot necessarily be satisfied with the current situation. There, you know, the brain, there always has to be a reason why we're going to expend more energy to do something. There has to be some benefit to us. And we think that that's what the curiosity aspect is, that we're inherently curious about what could happen in the future, what new thing, new unexpected thing could happen in the future, and what value or anti-value could happen to us. Now, if you see the alignment of these three, they basically align very closely with what we saw in relation to the animal evidence of animal innovation, except for the fact that we make the claim that meta-representation is actually the more specific skill that is associated with design cognition um, or design thinking. So while it's built upon the basic cognitive mechanisms that are used for mental time travel, there is an additional element that we have adapted that allows us to do design. So what we see then is what we've done is we've developed an, a, a framework that allows us to really think about these particular skills um, and where do the cognitive skills come from, which are recursion, curiosity, and meta-representation, and how these particular skills build up the kind of cognitive strategies that we know are emphasized when designers do designing. So for example, we know that framing is absolutely essential to design. How you decide that you want to see the world drives the entire design process. And that framing is all three forms of representation happening simultaneously. We also know that when designers are faced with situations of great ambiguity, they tend to use analogies. In other words, they take a known representation, try to think about what is that representation about? You know, what does this prior design case tell me? And then apply that meta representation to their current um, particular design problem. So we know from a lot of the cognitive design research that that is exactly what people are doing. And these have to then be built upon these particular skills because each of these cognitive skills are necessary for these particular strategies. So the basic idea, therefore, is that the cognitive strategies that underlie design thinking or design cognition are an extension of or an optimal adaptation of the cognitive skills that were present um, in 
of the, in the great ape lineage that allowed us to eventually build up to the capacity to do mental time travel. That's kind of where a bit of this research ends, and, and you can probably know and ask me, well, there are at least two big things that I've left out in this cognitive development, one of which is empathy, because design is built on empathy as well, and one of which is aesthetics. Right? These are two things that we haven't yet looked at, but we know the evidence is out there. So Franz de Waals has done a lot of amazing work on looking at um, um, fairness or, and justice in, in the animal kingdom, particularly in the great apes. And so we know that there are, are, in, are elements of that in the great apes. Aesthetics, unfortunately, is the one that we don't have a lot of evidence for. Um, and I'm not quite sure how we might deal with that. Or maybe we just say that the aesthetics, there's something else that's going on in relation to aesthetics. OK, let me take a brief diversion now and show you how I'm using some of these insights in order to um, do some more applied research um, uh, with some colleagues. So I'm working with a colleague in the City Business School who's a behavioral economist. And he looks at uh, decision making. But in particular, he looks at what uh, cognitive biases associated with the decision making. His supervisor was, by the way, there's a little Berkeley mafia at the University of Sydney, and we all seem to work together for some reason. Um, uh, he, his, he, was, he was a student of Dan Kahneman when Dan Kahneman was here um, as a professor. Um, so he and I have actually been looking at, well, do we actually see people applying the cognitive strategies associated with design to very complex decision making where you're trying to decide whether or not you want to support or not support a potential innovation, where we really do not know what's going to be the outcome of that particular innovation, but we still need to think about it. And what we found so far in our initial research has been very interesting. What we found is that when you tend to take a deductive approach and try to analyze your way into the future, which is the wrong way in terms of a design thinking approach in terms of thinking about the future, you almost always end up rejecting a project. When you take an abductive approach, in other words, when you start to apply the cognitive strategies that are associated with design cognition and actually start to mental time travel as you're doing the decision making, it tends to de-bias you. And we also uh, are finding that when people explore more frames, so in other words, they take a decision, but they do not assume that that decision frame is fixed. They try to explore alternative frames that may also explain what could be going on in the future they also tend to make more accurate forecasts about what might happen in the future, which is really quite interesting because this isn't the way that most people who approach decision-making uh, research um, take, the, take the setting. So for example, um, you know, we, we did a lot of coding of discussion and dialogue where people are actually are discussing about um, uh, uh, different potential innovation projects. And you notice here, for example, that um, the, the, an example of deductive thinking. You know, so there has to be a demand. If there's no demand, then it's useless. It relies on users going around taking photos of plants, applying a very deductive approach to say no. In the second situation, what's interesting is this is another person speaking about the exact same product. And that person says, no, but when, when I think you've also got to take into consideration, like maybe around city, it's a bit different. You're in a city, but I mean, if you like take entire country, there are definitely specific areas where there's obviously a lot more vegetation. Yeah, it could be everyday people who are just trying to find a certain plant and people who are interested. So actually what they're doing is they're abductively trying to mental time travel into the future in a, to a different kind of situation in which the potential innovation project could possibly be successful. So if you write this in terms of, of, of abductive logic, you would say that the observation would be it could be everyday people who are just trying to find a certain plant. So that, that was stated by the person. So the hypothesis that best explains that observation is that there is this vegetation app for interested people and if in, in these particular areas, then it makes sense that we observe people doing this kind of work. And so therefore, the best explanation is that there is reason to suspect that there is this vegetation app that would exist in specific areas in Australia. And sure enough, all of our statistical reduction and data analysis shows that when you, when you think abductively, you're much, much more likely to assign a higher score to a particular project. And therefore, you're also much more likely to accept the potential innovation. So the interesting conclusion that we arise from that is, in fact, design thinking is not only important during the design particular process, it's also really important during that final decision-making step where you have to take that strategic decision, am I going to go forward with this or not? And if you take a deductive approach, you may commit a lot of type one errors. This research is still ongoing, by the way. These are just some initial results. Okay. 
I have enough time to finish off the last two bits. So now I want to talk a little bit briefly about some of my, a little bit more technical research, if you will, but to show why some of this insight um, into thinking about animal innovations and cognitive skills has really helped to develop some of the research ideas that we've been working on. So I'm going to talk to you about an intelligent design tool, and Alice being in here will know this problem very well. Um, it, is the explosive hydraulic cylinder for which the picture has now decided to disappear from uh, my presentation. But this was a classic problem uh, in design theory methodology, which was how can you optimize um, this particular pressure cylinder um, such that it wouldn't explode but would be able to deliver a, a certain kind of force. It's a difficult problem to solve because it turns out that there are many possible optimal solutions um, and some of them are non-dominating non solutions. So how do you solve that particular problem? Well, it's been solved in various ways. It's been solved using Montanissi analysis. It's been solved using hypergraph analysis. It's been solved using uh, um, evolutionary algorithms, et cetera. There are many different techniques that have been tried. Well, we basically said, look, we know that if this is going to be successful, we know designers are going to try to re-represent this. They're going to try to do meta-representation. There is some other representation of this problem that's sitting in someone's brain. What algorithms out there do we know of that have some capability to re-represent a problem and also have some flexibility that we can actually alter, if you will, the level of granularity of that particular representation. Right? That's actually what we need. That's the algorithm that we need. That's actually how we start using singular value decomposition. So basically, if you look at and you try to find the orthonormal basis for some kind of representation, those orthonormal bases provide you all the information that you need to re recreate that original matrix. That's a well-known result from linear algebra. But also what's really interesting about the singular value decomposition is that if you decide that you want to cut off some of the singular values, in other words, you want to take a lower dimensional approximation of that particular um, data so that you can get rid of some noise, if you will, you can achieve arbitrary re-representations of the original representation. In, in other words, it is exactly what we're looking for. It is exactly meta-representation. And so by doing that on this particular problem, oh, I did this in Google Docs, and so that, that behavior is unusual. So what we did was we took the syntax of the representation. We did a secondary representation, which is to describe it as a design structure matrix, which tries to capture this, uh, the contextual co-occurrence syntax. And then we re-represented it one more time using singular value decomposition and took a lower dimensional approximation. And when we do that, this is kind of the, the, the coup de grace, if you will. So it was really, it's difficult, for example, in this particular problem to know which variables and which constraints are active. And if a constraint is active, what other constraints would be active? It's not very clear um, what, you know, what the answer would be. And as it turns out that if all you do is just do this re-representation and look at the cosine similarity between the variables, because the variables represent themselves as knowledge elements, we could actually exactly identify the various cases of, um, of, of monotonicity that were found in monotonicity analysis. So the three cases, the, the pressure inactive, the stress inactive, and pressure stress inactive. And we could simply do that by looking at these cosine measurements. So for example, in here we can show that the variable i is related to the stress um, and is closely related to um, um, the pressure despite the fact that they don't appear anywhere. And so we can actually start to make some assumptions on activity and based upon that we can actually solve the problem. So all we did was we looked at the cosines across different variables and from that we were able to deduce exactly the different cases um, that were apparent in the optimization problem. And then we used this basic technique to solve a whole bunch of other problems which appeared in Papalambros' book um, principles of optimization. I'm almost sure he was a reviewer for our journal article as well, um, in which we basically solved all the particular problems that he thought were really, really hard, but we showed how we could do it very, very efficiently. And it all stems from the fact that we rethought our problem as a problem of meta-representation. Meta okay, so in the last few minutes, and hopefully we'll all leave some time for Q&A as well, is I want to talk about um, the, the la my last topic, which is that design is a capability over which we need to exert, um, I'm sorry, design is a, it's, it's a capability over which we need to exert a moral claim because design is instrumental to the creation of habitats and artifacts that affect people's well-being. So the basic question that I'm raising here is, yes, of course we know that everybody has the biological and cognitive skills to do design. There is no question about that. But the question is, do we have the right socio-political instruments that allow that free expression of design to happen? And if that is, doesn't, does not exist, 
what do we say? Is that a, a claim for which we should exert a moral claim over it? Or do we just say, well, that's just the way things are? And clearly, that isn't the way that we'd like to approach this particular issue. So I've been working uh, pretty closely with a particular um, set of ideas which are called the capability approach. And the capability approach was developed by rather two people roughly independently, but also together as well, um, Amartya Sen, who's an economist, and Martha Nussbaum, who's a legal ethicist. And they come from slightly different perspectives, but they basically make the same argument, which is that there, are a, a, there should be a set of freedoms from which we choose from each of these particular freedoms. And what we choose to do in relation to those freedoms is our expression of well-being. In other words, we want to expand the capability space of, in the language of the capability approach, beings and doings of people. And that that is actually the, the moral concern of a, a, of a liberal government, is to make sure that we're expanding that particular capability space. And where that capability space is being constrained, then that, then that is considered a capability deprivation. The question then um, is, well, does design fit underneath some kind of moral claim like that? Do we think that that's actually uh, something that we would uh, exert a moral claim over? And in various articles that I've written, I have made the argument that in relation to a capability approach, it is something that we ought to make a moral claim over. Because we see lots of deprivations to design in, in many different contexts, um, both in developed countries, such as Sydney, uh, and also in developing countries. And so it is not an issue that is exclusively isolated to, um, to um, developing countries. So what, I, so what I want to really highlight here, other than the capability approach, is that in order to think about the capability approach, I actually had to go back and think, well, what are the capabilities that make up design cognition in the first place? And what are then the social and political institutions that give us that capability? I'm not saying, by the way, that anyone's stupid. We're, we're all, you know, everyone is smart enough. And the first time I gave this talk to someone in the audience actually said, are you telling me that there's people who are dumb and they can't do designs? Like, no, I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is that there are political situations that actually create situations of deprivation. So despite the fact that they have that biological cognitive capability, they're not able to express it. And that's what we're looking for. So what we did was we thought about, you know, what are the resources that people need in order to convert a capability set for design into the functioning of design. You know, what do people really need to have from institutions that allow them to do this? And to think about that, what we had to do was we had to go back, in a sense, to first principles. So what are the, you know, what are the personal cognitive requirements? So you know, if we think about analogical reasoning, meta-processing, meta, uh, meta or actually meta-representation, you know, what do they have to be allowed to do? So for example, in analogical reasoning, I'll, I'll stick to that because there's a lot of good evidence here. There's a lot of really good evidence that shows that students who come from a cultural background, usually socioeconomic background, in which they have no strong, in a sense, cultural grounding or have no strong interest in a particular aspect of culture or have never been allowed to allow that to have to be developed, are actually really, really struggle in particular design schools, in particular in architecture. So in other words, if you come to architecture school and you've never really, in a sense, experienced the world or, or had a, a experienced a culture and you have a cultural deprivation, it actually impedes your ability to become a successful designer because you actually lack those cultural references which are part of the analogical reasoning, which are part of the meta-representation that you actually need to do that. And so what we have to do a lot of work in in first year architecture classes, which we've done and we see this, is we actually have to work on developing that cultural capital and really getting students really interested back in, into thinking about their cultural capital. I'm going to talk ab about this also in relation to um, Aboriginal Australians again, too. Um, and then also we talk about the social factors as well. OK, it's, it's, it's fine that you also now have the, the cognitive capabilities. Well, what about the social abilities? You need to have been given agency. You need to have been given the, the actual ability to advance a particular design agenda. There's no sense in saying, you can design, but we don't want you to do anything that is counter to our agenda. <laughs> that, that, that would be considered a deprivation. And you see this a lot in developed countries as well. Um, I actually did a highly critical paper um, in Sydney about um, some development projects uh, using the capability approach. Um, and when I presented this, uh, a lot of people were not happy um, with the fact that you know, we, I talk so critically about the laws that actually prevent communities from actually having a very strong say in what it is that they actually want to design. Um, because 
for various reasons. But that's what we're talking about. There are deprivations to agency and there are deprivations to governance and deprivations to quality of participation, which all really go against your capability to design. So what I developed, um, and we, I won't go through all of them, but what we developed was we developed a design capability set. And this design capability set became an instrument by which we would start to evaluate social institutions and political public policy in relation to community, um, community design as if the community were ipso facto designers. In other words, they're actually behaving as designers, even if they don't want to be. Because we want to expand the capability space for those people to behave as designers if they wanted to. And that, that's basically the theory of the capability approach. This story, I think, is most interesting, and I'll conclude with, is talking about um, some of our res recent research with Aboriginal Australians in relation to design and capability. And I didn't have a chance to do some editing of the picture, but I think that they're okay with me showing um, their faces. So one of my PhD students, um, at the same time he was doing his PhD, was also working for One Laptop Per Child Australia to deliver Exo laptops to very, very remote communities um, in Australia. When we mean very remote, what it means is that he takes a jet to a major city, then he takes another plane to a smaller town, and then probably took another plane to a landing strip somewhere and then drove a few hours. That they're very, very remote. And what we want to try to do is we wanted to try to understand this particular design capability set in relation to augmenting the capability of indigenous Australians to, if you will, do design. Again, not saying that they don't know how to do design, but what are the kind of deprivations that we see implemented in public policy and in the kind of programs that the government likes to do to try to, if you will, raise the living standards of Aboriginal Australians. And what we found was actually, I think, kind of interesting. Because what it did was it actually challenged us to think that, you know, despite the fact that we think that we know what design is, there are also lots of communities out there who have a very different thinking about what they mean by capabilities to design. So for example, when we worked on the notion of abstraction, we wanted, and we thought about um, this, the analogical reasoning and et cetera, what we basically found was that many of the communities just wanted us to be able to emphasize local cultural vitality and in particular, the intangible cultural um, variety that is evident within their communities, rather than coming in and saying, OK, we're going to have a laptop. Let's make a car. That's not what they valued. And we, we had to learn that very, very quickly, that it was actually the intangible cultural values that they wanted to emphasize. And then we changed the way that we worked. They also really wanted to develop um, this interesting notion of authority. When we think of authority, we really think about kind of a self-motivated program, you know, you want to advance your own particular design agenda. That really wasn't the way that most Aboriginal Australians that we uh, worked with thought about that agency. For them, it was about expressing collective self-determination. So the more that we had actually could work with them in a way that it actually develops collective self-determination, that was actually much more valuable to them than developing individual self-determination. And that was a very strong um, a differentiation between the way that we understand authority, if you will, as a capability to design. And then finally, in relation to knowledge, what was also very interesting, and this, by the way, is still a big debate. Should you work in an Aboriginal knowledge system or should you work in a Western knowledge system? You know, some people will say you should only work with an Aboriginal knowledge system because you're working with Aboriginal Australians. And others will say, well, that's clearly not working for them. You should work with a Western knowledge system. Well, it turns out that Austro first Australians like to think about what's called the GANMA, together, two ways, both ways and in fact want people to work with them in the two ways and respecting the fact that when we talk about knowledge, there's always multiple systems of knowledge in operation at one time. And the fact that we can switch between these different ways of knowledge and they actually don't want to just work with Aboriginal knowledge and they don't want to just work with Western knowledge. They want to work somewhere two ways in between. And this was actually quite a, an interesting eye opener for us. So as we're doing this particular research, we're finding that when we talk about these notions of capability design, it is really interesting and important to start from the first principles, you know, what does it take to do design, but then to think where are the social cultural deprivations that lead to those deprivations and that capability, but also to look at them not from what we think are the capabilities, but really what are the capabilities that people would actually value themselves. So I'm going to leave you with this slide, but really I'm actually going to tell a story which I think wraps together, I hope, everything that I talked about tonight in my particular perspective. So when my PhD student finishes, the one who worked with the Aboriginal communities, finished his PhD, he gave me a gift. 
um, which is a bark painting. A bark painting is a very special style of Aboriginal art um, and was created by a friend of his in Arnhem Land, which is in the northeast tip near Darwin, but that means it's far. And what was really interesting is that over working with um, Crichton for many years and as well as you know, talking with him about his working with Aboriginal communities, he's had to re-educate me a lot about what it means to talk about a, of a language of design in an Aboriginal sense. So I learned actually that when you get that gift, you don't talk about what was her technique, where did the tree come from, what colors did she use, you know, all those, those very technical questions that we might like to talk from, from a Western perspective. But immediately what we did was we broke into what's called story work. So we talked about the story of land, which is represented, if you will, by the bark painting. And we talked about the relationship between us that was developed during the course of his PhD. And I think that that's what's nice about this as a metaphor. And that if you really want to understand something, we have to think about this capability to design in relation, to, if you will, to the order of the world. Where does it come from? Why is it even here? And what, is it, what, what advantages has it brought to us? And I think when we take, allow ourselves to take this really expansive view, to bring in a lot of the um, knowledge that is going to come from, from multiple disciplines, we're going to just get to a much more interesting and much more comprehensive understanding of design than, if you will, sticking within our particular um, discipline or understandings of, of design. And that's how I'd like to end up my talk today. Thank you. Is there anything coming in after this? So. You mentioned about the different traits that we have that we have evolved you know, in the, and one of them is kind of the love of novelty, you mentioned the pleasure of novelty. Uh, is there, uh, I'm sure there is something that I'm curious, how is this explained on evolutionary now? Novelty plus this. So how yes. is this explained? Okay, I was asked by Matthew to always repeat questions for the video. So, the, yes, yeah, so the question that was asked is what evidence is there um, that novelty um, it has occurred in evolutionary, in evolution, yes? Oh, or, how is it explained in evolutionary? Right, how is it explained? So, the, the way that I understand that it has been explained has to do with the architecture of the brain. So, the architecture of the brain of a simple non human species is such that there is a very strong and direct connection between perception and cognition. In other words, if you're a mouse uh, and you see a nest, the same neurons will fire pretty much every time that you see a nest. And if the thing that you're seeing is not a nest, those neurons won't fire. That, that, that's what we get with the mouse. And, so, and, and they've done lots of studies to show that, that it must be that, in a sense, nest perception is fixed in a mouse. In a human being, you'd never find that. Human beings really construct our representations. Um, the, our, you know, the way that our, the architecture of our brains are, works is that the signals are going through multimodal pathways. They're being integrated in different places. And the theory is that is that multimodal integration of, the, of, of stimuli and things that are going on in the brain that constructs various representations, alternative representations, and that there is then an intrinsic interest in those to look for novel representations. Now, you, you mentioned an interesting question. Wouldn't it be risky to think of things that are novelty? That, I think, is an interesting hypothesis, but I wonder if it's, it could be in the opposite, because it's into our advantage to think about things that might be risky so that we might be able to plan accordingly. So I think that, yes, it, you know, there is risk associated with getting our predic predictions on incorrect, but there's probably worse um, outcomes. Let's say, for example, in not worrying about climate change, and you know, let's just keep on going burning coal, for example, um, and, and the risk associated with uh, not making that kind of projection and trying to act accordingly because of that. So, you know, we, we're, I think our brain is programmed for that novelty. There's a lot of uh, research out in the, in the brain research that basically says the human brain is programmed for novelty detection. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about how technical standardization uh, relates to some of the topics you brought up. Um, I'm specifically thinking of how, like, whether it's a piece of software or building a house working with standardized goods both gives you building blocks so you can get high order things, but also does limit, you know, constrain individual designers. Okay, so the question was, does standardiz uh, how does standardization fit into this particular framework, and does standardization limit um, creativity, for example? 
The second one, let me start with the second one because actually I think the evidence is actually outstanding standardization does not necessarily limit creativity. In fact, one of the classic um, design problems in industrial design school is to make you design a chair. Why? Because chairs are made of very, very standard elements. And the, 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 the trick for you as a design student is to look at those standardized elements in a novel way to make a novel chair. That, you know, so I think it's, it's, it's true what you're saying, but you know, really the human creativity comes in when you're, you're constrained and hemmed in in a certain way, and you have to find that novelty out of that particular situation. So I, I guess my, my argument is I'm not 100% sure that it necessarily constrains novelty. Um, it, it could force it if, if that's what you want. The first, uh, first question is, well, within my framework, where does standardization come in? Well, I think in terms of standardization, where that comes in is actually in the, in the innovation side. So for example, in, um, in anthropology, anthropologists talk about cultural ratcheting. So cultural ratcheting is basically the fact that we create something and we leave the, you know, the residue of what we create for the next generation to pick up. And that cultural ratcheting is a behavior that is only really seen mostly in humans, but also in some great ape species. So for example, the fact that you know, the chimpanzees will continue to do things over millennia. The one difference being that so far, the great apes haven't bothered to build on what people have left behind. So we build on ideas, we build on theories, because otherwise we'd still be driving really bad cars um, and using cell phones that you know, weigh several pounds, right? Th that's, that's unique. So the fact that we standardize and we create these patterns is actually really part of a process of cultural ratcheting because then other people build upon that and that's a well-known way um, that we, we build on previous innovations in order for the next successive innovation. Okay, any other questions? I thought it was a brilliant talk, thank you. I really like thinking of design as freedom and this concept of, of, of agency and capability. And I thought your, your capabilities of design was interesting, but very abstract. Where would you put making in, in that capability <laughs> perspective? I know. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what I can say, I know. Um, the, the, you're right, it isn't necessarily abstract. Oh, sorry, so the question was, my, my capability design set was, looks to be very abstract. Where would you put tangible activities such as prototyping, making, and things like that? Um, does it fit in with that particular? And it actually turns out that it does fit in because the way that we use that framework is that we then apply those particular questions to very context-specific situations. So for example, we might question, for example, the extent to which a material cultural is a material culture is valued and preserved within a culture, right? So there are many cultures which do not value, they may value, but they get rid of their material culture. So as if there was no history in relation to the material culture. We ask questions about, for example, in terms of, of place, how much attention is brought to maintaining a sense of identity of this place because there are certain kinds of skills of making that were associated with making that particular place. So this building is a very good example of that. The fact that you cared enough to preserve the different ways that this, actually, this building was made retains a specific value of craft. That, to us, goes back to this capability for abstraction. You're keeping around that base of knowledge from which hopefully in the future you'll be able to draw these particular analogical um, ideas that you might apply to future design situations. And the question there is, well, do you keep it or do you not keep it? Do you have rules that say go ahead and mow it every single building down or do you try to have some historical preservation? So those are the kinds of questions that we would try to ask. Okay, any further questions? Okay, then we can thank Andy.